Are you tired of trying to create a player controller with Unity's new user input system by digging through the convoluted documentation and scouring through 30 minute to hour long videos? Well this tutorial is meant for you since I'll be showing how to install the input system, how to set up the input system, and show movement with a joystick and an action with a button via script in the shortest time possible. So no more time wasting, let's get moving, pun oh so intended. Have your Unity project open, I'll be showcasing the process within the 2020 LTS version, but this should be applicable in the 2019 LTS version and 2021 beta versions as well. To install the new user input package, click Window, Package Manager, select the packages dropdown, choose Unity Registry, Find Input System, and then click Install. Once the package is finished installing, it will ask if you want to enable the backends, which is needed, so select Yes, and Unity will restart automatically. The package manager should be automatically opened up once Unity restarts. It is okay to close out of it. I'm going to create a folder called Input System. In this folder, right click Create, Input Actions, then I'll give it a name Input System. Just name it something that makes sense to you. Now it is time to create our action map. So double click the input action item we just created. A new dialog window will open with three columns. A quick breakdown of these columns is as follows. The action map is essentially the container of actions that the player will have at their disposal depending on which map is active. The player may only have one action map active at a time. This is useful for example in a game like Grand Theft Auto where you can run around, jump, shoot guns, but then you can get in a car and drive around. If you use the same action map for both scenarios, you could end up with user inputs that overlap, such as the jump button would be the same as the accelerate button, and that would cause conflicts. Actions are just a container that holds the input bindings for each action, and the properties can be used to determine how the inputs can be interacted with and what type of outputs are generated by the user inputs. If none of this made sense to you, that is okay. Once we create our action map, it should make more sense. Let's create our action map. Click the plus sign in the action map column, which will immediately ask for a name, and I'll call it Player on Ground. This can be renamed by double clicking on the name. An action will automatically be populated, which I will rename to move, which can be renamed by double clicking the name or right mouse clicking and selecting rename. You'll notice next to the action's name there is a small green rectangle. This green rectangle will be next to all the actions inside of your action map. With our action selected, you'll notice the properties column has new options for us. Action type is fairly important to understand, and the nitty gritty of it is, a button is meant for cases where an action occurs with a single button pressed and is only triggered once. Pass through will accept all inputs and update according to all the input values. And finally, value attempts to take the strongest value from all the inputs and once it determines the strongest input, will ignore the other inputs. This is useful if you have a game that can be played with either gamepad or keyboard and mouse, and you want to avoid the player from being able to use both at the same time to get an advantage. I personally use the action type value for most actions. And for the control type drop list, you'll notice many options, which is essentially asking you what type of output do you want the user input to give. In our case, for movement, I want the output to be stick, which just means it will track the stick's value that we bind to this action and give us values accordingly. We don't need interactions or processors at this point. It is time to bind or assign our input to our action. Again, we are focusing on using a gamepad, so make sure you have a gamepad connected to your computer. You should notice that there is an arrow next to your action's name. Click this. A new options drop below and you'll notice there is a blue rectangle next to this. This is known as the binding option. Select it and notice new options appear in the properties column. The path drop down can be used to manually search what type of binding you want this action to have. If it is not giving you a drop down selection option, you need to click the letter T icon on the right hand side. A nice feature included in this package is if you click the drop down button, then select the listen button, you can push any button or or move any stick and it will auto populate inputs that match what you touched. In this case I want my left joystick and once it populates it gives me two options, the left stick for gamepad or left stick for Xbox controller. I have noticed that selecting the left stick for gamepad generally works well for a generic option and easily carries over for multiple controllers. Save the asset found at the top of the dialog window. Honestly, I'm sure most of you already knew how to do that portion since most tutorials cover that section very thoroughly. However, this is where the difficulty spikes a bit, and that is because you now have at minimum four options about how to handle the receiving of the input data and how to manipulate it. I plan on showing you the easiest option of handling this. In my scene, I have a 2D sprite acting as my player, but a 3D object could just as easily work. I have a 2D rigid body component attached and a 2D collider. I'll make sure my rigid body component has 
has gravity set to zero, and I'll check the freeze rotation option. This is just for my example. You can have these settings how you like for your project if you know what they do. We are now at the point where we need to decide how we want to collect our user's input, which for us we are going to use a component called player input. On our player, attach a player input component. Click the drop down arrow to see all the options available. For the actions input field, click it and select our input action item. Currently, we do not need to fill out the UI input module or the camera field for the purpose of this tutorial. The UI input module will be important when you start including UI elements to your game, which if you'd like to see a tutorial incorporating this, let me know down in the comments. As for the camera input field, this is important for multiplayer, which we don't need. You may have noticed the drop down options for the behavior field. We are going to keep this as send messages. This is essentially acting as a unity event and will make our lives much easier. There are three other options, but they start to scale up in complexity, which is what we are trying to avoid. The method I'll show you will be more than sufficient to be able to get the project up and running. I want you to notice the small box full of text below the behavior field. These are method names we can use in our code. Click off the player object and then click back on it. You should have noticed a new text appearing in this box. It should say on move, which should sound familiar since our action was called move. The player input component automatically creates an on method for any action we have in our input action item. Remember this method name since this is what we will be using in our code to get player input data. Time to go over how to actually code the controls. So start off by creating a C sharp script, which I'll call mine player controls. With the script open, I'm going to delete the start and update method since we don't need these for our script. We need to access a new library, so at the top of the script, add in using Unity Engine.input system. Since I'm going to be using Unity's built in physics to move our player around, we need to gain access to our player's 2D rigid body. We can achieve this by creating a serialized field tag, then creating a private rigid body 2D variable, which I'll call RB2D. I want to be able to easily adjust our player's speed, so create another serialized field tag, then a private float called speed. We need one more variable which can be a private vector 2 called move input value. This will store the value we get from our player's input. Remember that method name I asked you to hold in your brain? Well, it is now time to use that. Let's create a new method called onMove, and in the parentheses, we need to create the parameter input value with the name value. The name can be anything, but I prefer to use value. This method we created will now be invoked every time the player is moving the stick on our gamepad, which will pass the vector2 values through our parameter that we called value. So to store the value, type out our private vector2 we created earlier and set it equal to the value dot get less than vector2 greater than parentheses then semicolon. We can put a debug.log in this method as well to quickly check to see if it is working. Now we have the data from the user input, which is a vector2. A vector2 gives us two values, an x value, which would be the horizontal position of the joystick, and a y value, which is the vertical position of the joystick. These values can now be used in your typical movement method. In this case, I will be showing how to do movement with rigid bodies. Create a new private method, which I'll call MoveLogic method. Let us create a local vector2 variable, which I'll label result. We will set this equal to move input value multiplied by our speed value multiplied by time dot fixed delta time. We multiply by speed to give an easy method of controlling the speed via our inspector, and we multiply by time dot fixed delta time to help smooth out the movement since we will be calling our method in fixed update, which is meant for physics calculation. We now have a vector2 which can be used to set our player's velocity. To do this, call our rb2d variable dot velocity equals result. The last portion of the script is to create our fixed update method, which is meant to update after a predetermined number of frames. So the more frames your game is able to produce, the more times this update method will be called. With this created, call our MoveLogic method function and save the script. Go back to your Unity window. Apply the script to your player object, set the speed value, and drag your player into the RB2D field. Start your game and test. The left joystick should be moving your character around. If you are using this in 3D, remember that you are dealing with three dimensions, and the X and Z are typically the axes that player movement is based around. We now know how to collect input data from a joystick, but how about a button? 
Well, this is a very similar process to what we just did. Double click our input action item and create a new action by clicking the plus sign in the top right corner of the actions column. I'm going to name this new action button regular. With our new action highlighted, in the properties column, change the action type to button. Let's create another action and this time call it button hold. For this button hold action, in the properties, make the action type button and now click the plus sign next to interactions. You'll see five different choices which I'm going to select the interaction type of hold. All this option means is the player has to hold the button for a specified time frame before the action occurs. The interaction types I have seen the most used are hold, multi-tap, and tap. These are pretty self-explanatory and have decent Unity documentation. I'm going to leave the properties of the hold button as default values, but feel free to mess around with these. Lastly, assign a binding to both of our new actions, which I'll make mine both the gamepad south button and then save the asset. For further clarity, click on your player object and go to the player component. Review the text box that holds the different method names, and you should notice both of our new actions receive their own methods. Go back to our player control script. Create two new methods based on our new actions which in my case will be private void on button regular and private void on button hold. Since a button can be used from anything such as jumping all the way to shooting, we will just create a generic demonstration of how the different button actions will work. Let's create a debug.log in both methods and I'll put a message that makes sense in both logs. That was all that was needed for the scripting, so save and go back to Unity. Start your game and do a simple press of the south button of the gamepad and you should notice in the console that our debug message appears. Now hold the button. You should notice that the debug message for the regular button press shows, then after the determined time frame, the hold button message appears. It is also good to take note that these actions only fired once while holding the button down. That means the button needs to be released and pressed again for the action to occur again. Well that should get you all on the right track on using the new Unity user input system. There are a multitude of ways to achieve the effects that we created with the possibility of even more control on how the inputs can work. However, with more control comes more complexity, and this is meant to get you up and running as soon as possible with as little headache involved. And honestly, the amount of control this offers is something I find very appealing for such a convenient package easily binding multiple inputs to a single action. With this all said, if you found this useful, please leave a comment below letting me know what you were able to achieve using this new user input package. I want to thank you for watching, and as always, stay safe.